Hello and welcome to our webcast uh, today, which is a rerun of a series of talks we did around the country during September. We're recording this on the 1st of October, so anything that happens after the 1st of October, I didn't know about it. Uh, okay then, let's get stuck in. Um, presentation today is around the financial advice market review for the farmer, as it's been aptly titled. Um, the market review actually took place uh, a couple of years ago now, so it's, it's a review of a review, uh, which is taking place at the moment, and we're expecting results out in mid-2020, uh, which will actually be a little bit later than we were supposed to put results out uh, in Q4 2019, but obviously that little thing called Brexit has gotten in the way, so the FCA is running a little bit, a little bit behind schedule here. Before we get to that, though, let's just recap on what the purpose of the original uh, financial advice market review was all about. And really, it was a acknowledgement of some of the residual issues that uh, RDR created. So you'll recall RDR was introduced in 2012 and introduced a number of major changes into the industry. Uh, I think you know from this side of, on this side of the, of the telescope, no one would. No one would suggest that the RDR had a negative uh, impact on the industry as a whole, but there were some unintended consequences. Um, you, know, you think of what the primary focus of, of RDR was. It was around raising the standards of advisors within the industry, so everyone had to get minimum levels of qualifications. Uh, also, it changed the business model for a number of advisors, so it was now uh, not possible to receive remuneration. Uh, via commission from product sales. So fundamentally changed uh, the, the landscape within advisor world. Uh, like I say, for the better, I would argue, but it did have some unintended consequences, primarily in the form of a significant drop originally in number of advisors in the industry. Yeah, I think you had, you know, a lot of people who towards the end of their advising career who decided, you know, after maybe 30, 40 years of, of giving you financial advice, uh, they were not that keen on spending two years of their life um, getting qualifications, which, which they've not had throughout, throughout uh, their lives. And then also it changed the, the revenue profile within businesses as well. So we did see, as a consequence of, of RDR, a uh, reasonable drop in advisor numbers from about 33,000 to about 25,000, 26,000 uh, post-RDR. And we saw a drop off in the number of firms who were prepared to give financial advice. And those firms who did stick around focused very much on offering advice to mass affluent and high net worth individuals. Uh, and as a consequence of that, people who were perhaps had sums of between maybe 10 to 50,000 pounds to invest, uh, who previously had access to advice because A, they thought it was free, when of course uh, we as an industry were being remunerated by public sales. Uh, but they thought the advice was free. Um, when then being faced with the with the need to to pay upfront uh, for advice, they kind of recoiled at the cost of, of advice. And also, kind of, it didn't make sense economically because you know a, a typical piece of advice will be between four and nine hours work. Uh, our figures suggest that the average hourly rate for, for advisors who who are charging by the hour. Is between 120 and 150 pounds per hour, so a thousand pounds worth of advice um, in order to take advice on a 10,000 to 50,000 pound investment case becomes uneconomical. And as a consequence of that, there are now a number of people within the UK who just simply don't have access uh, to advice. So, the original focus of the financial advice market review, which is a joint initiative of the Treasury and the FCA, is to ensure that people get affordable, accessible advice and guidance, and that's a key phrase we'll come back to late, later. Uh, everyone gets access to that at all stages of their lives. And in particular, just to narrow down the focus, I don't think anyone's ever complained that they couldn't find a mortgage broker or an insurance broker. The focus is very much on advice when it comes to pension accumulation, investments, and retirement thinking. And retirement thinking is, is again, something that we'll, we'll return to later on within the webinar. 
Okay, so like I say, it, this is a review that, that took place. It took place over 2015-2016, and the FCA and the Treasury reported back in 2016 made 28 recommendations, and you'd be glad to know I'm not going to run through all 28 of those recommendations. I'll just pick up the highlights of those 28 recommendations and work from there. Um, first and foremost, there was the establishment of the Financial Advice Working Group, um, another four less acronym if, if you were looking for one. Um, and the Financial Advice Working Group is, was really designed to assess um, how the advice market works within the UK and also trying to share uh, best practice. So if you're not familiar with the, with the, the work of the working group, um, maybe something where the Google there's some useful bits of, of information in there. Uh, on affordability, they made recommendations in terms of uh, clarifying the perimeter between guidance and advice. And I think this is something we will see a lot more focus on going forward. Given that you know, the, the primary focus of, uh, of Pharma was to address the people who had dropped off the advice uh, radar as a result of the increasing cost of, cost of advice, uh, there is a focus now to get to um, to focus uh, focus around giving guidance as opposed to full fat advice. And there's also this a new uh, bracket of streamlined advice again, which we'll touch on a bit later on. Uh, the FCA think that suitability reports in some instances are far too long. I think as advisors and power planners, you probably agree with that. Uh, so there is some uh, some work taking place behind the scenes to shorten the length of suitability boards where possible. Um, given that they couldn't come up with a, a, a suitable solution and they're not going to enforce lower costs uh, and lower prices on advisors, they've really passed the book on to employers and suggested that maybe employers should be the, the people who shoulder the burden here. Uh, leveraging their ability to give guidance and streamline advice to a large number of people uh, at, a, at a focal point. Uh, employers are being encouraged to bring in financial advisors into the workplace uh, in order to give some sort of streamlined advice. Um, and then kind of in terms of redress, there was, uh, there was review into the FSCR and how that is funded. And there's also been a review on the long stop on, for advice um, so you, you, you'll be aware, of course, that you know, the, there are restrictions in terms of how long a customer uh, has access to, to the FOS uh, when it comes to complaints. But they, they have reviews and, they, and they've rejected the, the concept of putting a long stop on advice, given that in, in cases such as you know, annuity sales, uh, endowments, etc., these are long-term pieces of advice and it takes a long time time before you get to see whether the advice was appropriate or not. So they've reviewed that and rejected it, but something they may come back to. But really what I want to focus on today is uh, the final part, actually the final recommendation, which was let's come back to this in three years' time, having collected lots of data about the marketplace. So in 2016, um, the FCA commissioned um, an extension of its work with advisors uh, and anyone in the uh, RAMR um, on behalf of your practice, one know that that platform has gotten longer over, over recent years. And what they also did is they commissioned a piece of uh, research um, which looked at the lives of consumers, called the Consumer Lives Survey, and they t they've done that in 2017 and again in 2018. And it's those two data sets that I, I want to focus on today and give you a, a bit of an overview on what's happening within the marketplace both from your customer's point of view, but also from a financial practice point of view. So they're the two main data sets that we'll focus on. So let's kick off with a bit of a backdrop to what's taking place in the marketplace. This is from the Financial Lab Survey. Tons of data in the Financial Lab Survey. What it does demonstrate is there are only a small proportion of adults in the UK who actually have any investments at all. There's, there's 51 and a half million adults in the UK when they conducted the survey. And of those, you know, there's, there's 12, 13 million people who have any investments whatsoever. And you can see in terms of how we've structured this graph here, um, there's a very small number of, of adults in the UK who have what you as an advisor would consider to be a meaningful sum. So, you know, your target market will be Typically, people went over £50,000 to invest. So that's the, the last three columns there. 
and you'll see you know that amounts to about three million people in the UK who have access to that sort of uh, that sort of wealth. The financial life survey is particularly useful because not only does it give big picture uh, stories like that, but it, it, it's quite granular. You know, Thirteen thousand people were were interrogated almost on you know granular level detail about their financial lives. And so one of the interesting things you can do with this data is you can then cut that information according to age cohorts as well. And that, that's the result that you see there. So interestingly, I think I, you know, we, we see this when we speak to advisors around the UK on a regular basis. A lot of advisors tell us that they have fantastic businesses, except there's one major drawback with their business, which is all of their customers are very old. And I personally don't see that as a drawback. Well, I think it's a, a function of the marketplace and a function of who actually owns the money within your, within your target market. We're also told you know, by lots of people that we need to you know, modernize our practices and maybe we need to uh, attract millennials in, into, the, into the advice habit uh, through use of ESG and SRI uh, kind, of, kind of setups. And you know, there's, there's nothing to suggest that you ought not to be doing that in your practice but I would contest that it's really not going to attract millennials into your practice, given that there's only 72,000 millennials in the UK who have more than 50,000 pounds worth of investments. And given that there are 26,000 advisors in the UK, that means if you all follow that strategy, you'll on average get between two and three additional customers for what will be a reasonably significant overhaul of your central investment proposition. You know, if we look at this on a percentage basis, you can see there that the, the people within the target market of £50,000 or more to invest are typically age over 45 and certainly more, in fact, more likely to be aged over 55. And, and, and so therefore, you know, if you are looking at your practice and thinking it's a great practice, but does it have longevity given the age of my client bank? Uh, I would argue that it's it, it, it's the same as it ever was. You know, it's people who accumulate savings over a long period of time are statistically more likely to be the people who've got large assets on the management. Uh, and therefore, and, and interestingly, as, as we'll show later, they're also the people who are more likely to seek out financial advice and more importantly, actually to listen to that advice. And so if you are looking at your business and thinking you've got too many old people in the practice, don't worry about it. You're in the same boat as everyone else. And if you are looking, you know, for your next generation strategy, I would contest that. You know, rather than focusing on SRI or ESG or becoming social media uh, warriors, um, having active Twitter and you know LinkedIn accounts and, and all this kind of stuff, I would argue that a much more uh, coherent strategy would be to invite the sons and daughters of your current customers along to financial consultations and get them involved in the in, in the process at an early age because you know they're statistically a more likely to be interested in financial advice given that their parents take financial advice and they're also the people who inherit the money that your that your current clients actually have. So having them involved in, in, in the process and having them understanding uh, your ethos and, and, and your approach to, to invest, investment. Uh, and financial advice is a, is a much stronger strategy, I would argue, than going off and chasing the 72,000 millennials in the UK who actually have some money that you'd be interested in. On a number of bases, and we've already discussed that the people in that target market, 50,000 and above, will, will statistically be older than the rest of the population. But there's a number of other uh, key features that you can pull out of the financial health survey. They're also more likely to be educated. They're also more likely to have higher average income, which again is kind of the two go hand in hand there. They are statistically more likely to be in a couple. They're likely to own their own home. And I think this is perhaps interesting. They're more likely to have been or are currently self-employed as well. And it's really interesting because if you then read those, you know, they, those character traits of, of people who, who have significant sums of money, read those character traits. And then look at the information about financial advisors in the UK. You also find that financial advisors in the UK are also statistically more likely to be older, more likely to be educated, do have higher average incomes. 
they're not statistically more likely to be in a couple. You're just as likely to be divorced as a financial advisor as everyone else in, in the UK. Uh, I typically do own your own home and almost by definition, particularly if you're working for a, a smaller practice of between one, one to five advisors, you are effectively self-employed as well. And so what this data suggests, uh, it certainly suggests to me anyway, is financial advice, as you probably all know anyway, is as much about affinity as it is about your financial knowledge. And whilst RDR was great in raising the bar for everyone's you know, product knowledge and, and wrapper knowledge within the UK, financial advice remains a people industry, and it's as much about affinity as it is about, uh, as about professional wealth opinions. So let's talk a little bit more about your customers, and what we'll do here is we'll drill into the to the survey data and have a look at the people who actually took financial advice. So this isn't the general public at large now, we're talking specifically about people who took financial advice, and actually you know, of the 50 or million people, uh, 50 or million adults in the UK, only 6% of adults in the UK actually took financial advice in 2017, 3.2 million people, which on the face of it, it looks like there's a bit of a market failure there, but I would contest, given that we've also just looked at the statistic to show the number of people who have over £50,000 to invest, I would say that this is a very clear sign of the market working phenomenally well. There are only about 3 million people who have uh, have assets that, uh, as financial advisors, you would be interested in, in advising on, and 3.2 million people took financial advice in the past 12 months. Uh, that's the group one uh, slice of, of, of this chart here. Where the FCA are particularly uh, interested in, in, in addressing the, the shortfalls in the marketplace and the focus of the financial advice market review is on that group two segment there. So these are, in the opinion of the FCA and the Treasury, people who probably ought to take them financial advice. They had sufficient sums or their, their financial position was sufficiently complex enough that they would have benefited from taking financial advice. But they didn't take financial advice. And when you interview the people in group two, while they didn't take financial advice, you get typically the same two answers, which is it's too expensive or I don't trust the people within the industry. Um, now, like I said, I don't think the FCA have any intention of becoming price regulators. So the price is the price and the price will be subject to inflation. I would argue, given the uh, given the number of advisors, the fine balance between the number of customers who are seeking advice and the number of advisors within the UK, you know, the price of, of advice is only likely to increase. I, I would contest, and so that's why the real focus of, of the review is on the guidance and the streamlined advice uh, parts of the market. How can we address the people in Group Two without them taking the full path of advice? And, and like I say, we'll, we'll come back to that a little bit later on. Of the people who took advice, and again, as advisors and panel partners, you probably more than familiar with this data, but the, the wonderful thing about advice is, of the people who do take financial advice, it becomes habit forming. People who take advice see the benefit of that advice and keep on coming back for more. The single biggest reason why people took advice in the past 12 months is because they've taken advice before, it becomes habit forming. Uh, but you know, the other thing is that to pick out, pick out of this data is the next most important reason why people will take advice is they're referred by someone within their network or a significant change has happened in their life. You know, there's a birth, death, a marriage, a significant change in, in, in their life, a major life event makes them reassess, uh, and, and go look for financial advice. I think interestingly, one of the things that clearly doesn't work is advertising. So, Again, if you're, if you are looking at your, at your budgets for next year, uh, you might want to just reconsider your, your, your advertisement in the horse and hound or Cheshire Life or wherever the publication may be because as you can clearly see, the, the information here suggests that people don't see an advert in the publication then rush off and decide that they must take financial advice. I think what is interesting though is you know, if you are spending money on advertising, I would contest that you ought to stop that. Uh, but you might want to consider going to church if you are, you are looking to expand the number of customers because if you're going to be part of a network, if people are going through significant changes in life, births, debts and managers, you can bet your life that you'll find those people in church. So stop advertising and get yourself to church is the, uh, is, is the message that you take from that information. 
again, just to emphasize that uh, advice becomes habit forming of the people who took financial advice, half of the people, or practically half of that 3.2 million people who took advice in that last 12 months have been taking advice for more than five years. And this is, this is useful data because what we also see is when you look at, look at the information, the length of relationship also increases the propensity to actually act on your advice. Um, and such to the point that, you know, if you are sat in front of someone who's taking advice for the first time, there's a 50-50 chance that they will either take or reject your advice completely. Um, and the longer that your relationship forms, you know, you, the more likely you are to get that advice. So in particular, if I'm thinking about people who are managing uh, perhaps maybe model portfolios on an advisory basis, you'll all be familiar with, them, with one, of the, one of the biggest issues with, with, with that setup which is every time you want to change uh, a position in the model portfolio, you write to all of your clients who subscribe to that model. And invariably, even if you're really, really good and have really great client relationships, only four out of five of the people you write to or contact actually take uh, take the trouble of coming back to you and saying, yes, I want to want to make that change. And as a consequence, you know, you can end up with a bit of a fractal pattern of multiple model portfolios of different vintages. Uh, the good news is the longer you have those client relationships, the more likely they are to take five or advice. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm reminded of the words of Evelyn de Ross Charles who said, you know, it is possible to make money out of making wine, but the first couple of hundred years are quite tough. The longer you stick at this game and the deeper your relationships with the clients, uh, the, more, the more likely they are to take advice. Um, and the more, the, the more, safe and sound that, that your life will be. Well, I think that this is just a throwaway comment, actually. Really interesting, you know, of all the financial knowledge that, that, that you guys have as advisors and para planners, um, this is a really interesting statistic which suggests that two-thirds of your customers knew exactly what they wanted to do anyway. They were just looking for some sort of confirmation from you. Um, I'm not entirely convinced by the numbers on that one, but it, it is an interesting uh, almost a new uh, throwaway statistic there. So anyway, look about your customers, let's talk about your business in particular. Um, what we did when we were out on the road is um, we presented some of this information to over 300 advisors uh, as we traveled up and down the country uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, we also conducted a survey of the advisors in the room about their, their practices as well. So what I'll do is as I go through the next couple of slides, the purpose of these is really to have a look at the RMAR data that the FCA produced, and there's a lot of that data uh, made available to us. It's to take a look at that data and allow you to almost benchmark your, your own practice against what's going on within the rest of the industry. Before we do that, let's just take a, a brief look at the industry post RDR. I mentioned before, you know, the number of advisors in, in the UK dropped significantly post RDR. Um, a number of firms dropped significantly, but, but since then, you know, both advisor numbers and firm numbers is very much on an upward trend. So we're now back to over 5,000 financial advice firms in the UK. So a competitive market, you, you would suggest. Uh, and, and as I say, about 26 and a half thousand advisors, give or take a few, uh, operating within the UK. The bars on there show you the revenue taken by the industry. So as an industry, financial advice now takes about four billion worth of revenue across those 5,000 or so firms. Significantly up uh, on the numbers post RDR, where the figures were more around two and a half billion. A reasonable proportion of that is, uh, is market related, but obviously I mean, most firms, they can add a load and charge based on assets under advice. And obviously, as those assets increase in swelling value, that increases the um, the revenues available. But I think the, the, the really noticeable uh, statistic from this is the drop off in the level of revenue generated from commission, which of course it was banned on the RDR, but you can still take commission on pre RDR written business. One of the often debating points that comes up uh, in regulatory circles on this topic is. Should there be a sunset clause on PRDR commission-based business? You know, should there be a date at which it's no longer feasible for you to, to, to take uh, commission on advice that you're given uh, pre-2012? 
you know, if you look at the you look at the terms of reference of the RDR and the financial based market review, one of the terms is to ensure that the industry has a, a healthy future, effectively, that businesses are sustainable in the long term. And so I would I would argue that you know it's still about seven hundred and fifty million pounds worth of revenue coming into the industry uh, via pre RDR written uh, business and commissions. I would contest that you know it's it's unlikely that we'll see those revenues pulled out of the industry because you know given that that is largely you know near one hundred percent gross margin kind of revenues that would have a significant impact on profitability of the industry at large and so until that red bar becomes almost um, almost negligible, I would be surprised if we see the FCA coming with any sunset clauses on commission in the in the near future. I talked about the number of firms in the UK, but these are the number of us and how they're distributed. Uh, so most firms in the UK are what the FCA considers small practices. So you, the FCA splits uh, practices according to these classifications in terms of number of advisors. So you have a loan advisor, small practice, medium enterprise, and large scale uh, financial services businesses. That's how the FCA re refer to, to business. Most firms in the UK are small practices, so between one and five advisors, but most advisors in the UK work for large financial organizations. And it's just interesting to make that, make that distinction. We'll come back to this data a bit later on. Can you page when you take your choice? You know, there's clearly advantages of being in large scale practices in the form of, you know, regulatory oversight, um, network services, ability to access <coughs> centralized, um, centralized resources, maybe someone's going out and getting leads for, for new clients, et cetera. But on, on the flip side, of course, if, you, if you're in a loan, loan advisor practice, you have complete control of absolutely everything, including where you work from, what your culture of your business is, all of your individual practices. And so, can you, I'm not suggesting there's a, there's a good or bad here. There's just differences in, in the business model. And we'll dive into some of the business models now. Um, most practices in the UK, this is platform data as opposed to FCA data. Platform data suggests that about two thirds of practices in the UK have less than 100 million of assets under administration. And you know, when you consider that most practices in the UK have less than five advisors, and you know that that, that data is very consistent with the uh, with the data that we've just taken a look at there. Whenever you do a survey, there's always a little bit of asset uh, inflation when people say how much money they they are advising on. And we saw that in our Asia Bell survey as well. So what we found with Asia Bell uh, advisors who were on, at the on the road uh, presentations. About half of people uh, suggest that they were managing more than 100 million. Uh, so again, you always get a bit of survey uh, advice in there. One of the next questions we asked was thinking about the investment strategies that are used. Um, which, you know, which were the most likely um, strategies to be used? What you tend to find here is that there's a real, still a, a dichotomy uh, amongst advisors. About half of advisors uh, out, are now in, in, into the world of focusing very much on financial advice uh, and tax planning, etc., and have opted to outsource investment solutions to uh, a DFM or an MPS provider. And around half of advisors are utilizing either their own advisory model portfolios consisting of single strategy funds, or for, and typically for smaller clients, uh, they'll utilize their own fund selections when it comes to either multi-asset or multi-manager funds. And this information here kind of sh shows that in practice, the red bars show uh, the propensity to use any one of those strategies for any client. But the grey bars show you where the where, where the, the value of money is is held, and actually from this data here uh, from platform, uh, whereas we saw roughly a 50-50 split of people outsourcing investment, uh, what we see in the platform studies is whilst half of advisors may outsource investment, it tends to be either that's a blanket uh, um, decision for the entire practice. Or they'll only outsource investment for larger sums of money, and in those cases, typically they'll outsource to a, to a DFM. 
And so when it comes to value terms, actually the bulk of money within the industry is still being managed on an in-house basis, either through advisory model portfolios or by a multi-asset or multi-manager fund. We then went on to talk about charges, which, which was a, which is an interesting one. Uh, asked the question around you know, thinking specifically of initial charges, uh, what's the, what, which best describes uh, how you charge customers. Uh, what we found in the AJBL survey was about two thirds of advisors were charging a ad valorem fee, but this is from, this is wider industry data from the FCA's uh, Armour returns. And what they saw was about, for initial advice, about half of advisors are charging on an ad valorem basis. And in the instances where they are charging on ad valorem basis, independent advisors uh, typically are uh, charging on average about 2.8% on an initial basis. Now, when we surveyed the AJPL, AJPL um, advisors who came into to the survey, the results of the ad valorem charge was significantly lower there. So it, just an interesting one to come out of, you know, maybe if you are reviewing your, your price tariffs, you might want to just take into account some of this information in terms of what a typical initial charge structure would be. Uh, what we found is the people who attended our, our roadshow tended to be underpricing their initial advice. Um, you know, that, that might be a conscious decision, but it may also be an unconscious decision. So it's, it's worthwhile having access to this information so that you've got some context to set your own charging structures by. Similarly, on a ongoing charge structure, Again, we saw about two thirds of advisors charging our uh, ad valorem fee. Uh, but, you know, it is, it is interesting to see the number of people who are now charging a fixed fee or a, or a hourly rate, uh, when it comes to ongoing charges, uh, on a retainer basis. But still about, you know, the predominant, uh, charging structure is very much on an ad valorem basis. And again, the industry wide data suggests that independent advice, advisors are charging on average, about 72 basis points. And um, what we tend to find there is that, that will be a split of people who are charging between 15 and 75 basis points. And they tend to be the advisors who have chosen to outsource investment. And then people who are charging between 75 and 100, and 100 basis points. And they tend to be advisors who are still in sourcing, uh, the, uh, the investment solutions. What was also noticeable is when we went, went around the country, uh, the advisors that we surveyed, the data was very consistent with the industry average uh, in everywhere apart from London. Uh, advisors in London, we found, were charging on average about 25 basis points more than advisors everywhere else in the country. So just an interesting regional uh, description there. Reason, um, kind of, when we asked people what, uh, what their charging structures were, we were asking specifically around, uh, a client with £125,000 to invest. Reason we chose that was just kind of £125,000 is a really useful benchmark reference client to use because then you can kind of take a view on when you're charging, set your, your charging structures for smaller or larger clients. You can get get a feel from the um, uh, the uh, FCA data. You can get a feel for kind of what everyone else in the industry is doing when in terms of increasing their charges or lowering their charges uh, for different sizes of clients as well. So, 125 thousand pounds is a useful reference client to think about in order to benchmark your practice against the rest of the industry, and also benchmark that pricing point for other clients that you may be looking to. I come back to this information on the kind of where the advisor market is, is split. I said that most firms in the UK are smaller practices, but most advisors in the UK work for large institutions. What you can do is if you delve deep enough into the uh, FCA data, you can work out what the, the average revenue um, per advice you know, per advice style or, or size, size of practice is really interesting. You can also uh, kind of calculate what the average cost per advisor is um, within practice as well of different sizes. And so what we did is we, 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 we did that information, we did that digging uh, and pulled the information out. And what you can see is, you know, 
the sweet spot uh, for revenue per advisor tends to be in the two to 50 pound of bracket. A uh, number of reasons why that would be the case. Um, you know, so larger clients are less inclined to go with a advisor where there's only a single advisor in the practice. And so larger clients tend to be looking for, you know, for a an institution rather than a, a, a low uh, loan advisor. So that explains why you get the increase in revenue per advisor there. But what it doesn't explain is the drop off in revenue per advisor once you get into the large organizations. Um, what we do find that is if you if you delve a little deeper is in the large organizations, and again you know, I refer back to you may have a may have a team of people who are looking for new client referrals, etc. Uh, what you tend to find is larger organizations are more inclined to also take on smaller clients as well as larger clients. And that's why on a revenue per advisor basis, you get a bit of a drop off at that level. But what's really interesting is when you have a look at the cost per advisor. Uh, now I think, you know, some of the, some of the cost per advisor in a, in a loan advisor operation are, are quite obvious, you know, uh, for, for loan advisor, you're not, not necessarily incumbent upon you to have business premises. Uh, you know, so a number of advisors will operate, uh, from home. Uh, for operating on, on a single advisor basis, so that re reduces our uh, business costs reasonably significantly. So your costs per advisor are, are quite uh, quite small. But as you go up the scale, there's a step change as you go into larger and larger practices in the cost per advisor basis. Reason for that, of course, is as your organisation becomes more complex, you have to have additional layers of management and risk controls in order to manage that complexity. And so as you get into larger practices, you end up with senior and middle layers of management, which, you know, you can draw your own conclusion whether it, whether they're a dead weight on the, on the business, but they certainly do add to the cost and they definitely don't add to the, add to the revenue because they're, you know, typically not giving advice themselves. Uh, they're acting in a managerial capacity to manage the complexity. And as a consequence of that, you know, you can see the, the standout figure here, of course, is, is that negative figure on the far right there, which shows that in large financial practices, uh, the profit per advisor is actually negative, which begs the question, you know, kind of how can these large financial practices, are they sustainable in the long term? But of course, in large practices such as this, in large networks such as this, what you'll tend to find is the advice is part of a vertically integrated business. And therefore the advice is being used in some cases as a lost leader in order to leverage people into restricted investment uh, offerings. And as a consequence of that, you know, you know, moving from different types of advice practices into larger organizations. And you know, we're very conscious that a lot of, um, a lot of consolidators within the marketplace are looking to gobble up, you know, what would be considered smaller practices uh, in order to, to build up large networks. What tends to happen in those sorts of transactions is the, the, the purchase price is funded primarily by the fact that these, these advice practices also know that they don't just get access to the advisor's client base. They also have the ability to convert those clients into a restricted investment pack, investment offering where they will then recoup a higher margin. And so, you know, if, if it is something that you're considering, you know, what's my exit plan for my, for, for my business? Um, you know, there are some significant cultural differences of working in a smaller practice compared to a larger practice. And, you know, you need to be cognizant that in, in a large number of, of larger practices, uh, financial advice will be used as a loss leader uh, for the for the more lucrative investment management piece of piece of the operation. So anyway, some predictions for the future. Um, what you've seen is, is really a scratch on the surface when it comes to the the amount of data that really is available to the, to the regulator these days. And so, kind of having just um, Having just said how great it is to be in a small financial practice, I think one of the things I, I, I would highlight is if you are in a smaller practice of between one and five advisors and your attitude to an FCA visit in the past has been, 
and so inconsequential in the grand scheme of things that the FCA are very unlikely to come and visit me in, in my practice. I would I would try to dissuade you of that notion. The FCA's uh, approach to arrow visits is very risk targeted, and so it is done on a risk a risk weighted basis. But they are increasingly using data more these days in order to determine where the risks are. And so small practices are not immune from FCA arrow visits anymore. Um, if you are an outlier, outlier on the data, there is a good chance that the FCA will, will come, in, come in and visit your practice. So kind of just bear that in mind um, you know, when I think, you think about your file reviews and how well your, your files are maintained. We know from the suitability surveys that smaller practices are more likely to be pulled up by the FCA for uh, suitability breaches and, and suitability of, of advice. And so the, the recent statistics said that uh, 93% of all advice in the UK was deemed suitable, which is a great testament to the advice that is taking place without in the, U, in, without in the UK. But larger practices, their uh, suitability tended to be more like 96, 97%, and smaller practices, one to, three, one to five advisors, had suitability marked at around the 88 and 90% level. So you know, the FCA are cognizant that small practices, that, you know, record keeping, because you're busy doing everything, everything else, of course, record keeping might not be as strong as, as it is in a larger practice. And uh, you know, don't be surprised if, if you do get a visit. Uh, I talked a little bit before about the perimeter between uh, guidance and advice. I think we're going to see a lot more focus on this, on this more nuanced uh, halfway house of streamlined advice. Uh, and you can see that as an opportunity or a threat, really. You know, so there is an argument that, of course, you know, the amount of advice needed for a DB transfer where someone's got multiple uh, pension schemes accumulated over, over a number of years, the amount of advice that goes into that is significantly greater than you know, a 35 year old who wants to do, you know, wants to start a SIP and wants to invest this year's ISA. Uh, in a pretty basic accumulation strategy. You know, the amount of advice that is significantly different. And so the argument from the FCA is there may be an, and there may be cause for simpler levels of advice and not receive the full fat, uh, version, version of advice and they could benefit from having access to streamlined advice, which would be a, a more cookie cutter uh, approach to advice. Uh, that of course comes with, you know, the consequence of it's probably less lucrative because less time ought to mean or ought to lead to uh, lower charges being being uh, in, in care by the client. So you see that potentially as as, as a threat to your business. But uh, you know I, I refer back to that twelve and a half million people in the UK who didn't receive any advice at all because they don't trust people in the industry or they consider that the the cost of advice is too high. So if you are considering you know, offering streamlined advice, yes, it may cannibalize some of your existing client base, although you know, we, we've kind of already analyzed the, the age demographic of people who take, a, take advice. It won't cannibalize a significant proportion, but it may open up that 12.5 million people in the UK who don't take advice based on this charge. It may, may open up um, that marketplace to you. So opportunity or a threat, but streamlined advice is very, very much something that the FCA will, will be focusing on going forward. And the final one is just really around uh, where the focus of suitability reviews are likely to be going forward. Our last major suitability review took place in 2017, and so we are due another one from the FCA very shortly. And in fact, I wouldn't be surprised if those questionnaires are, are landing on doorsteps as we speak. Uh, so a suitability review will be repeated. Um, we'll get results of that in 2020. The focus of that suitability review is going to be very much around pension transfers, and obviously DB has been a, an area that's re already received a lot of focus, but also around retirement income focus as well. And what I mean by that is people are transitioning from accumulation into decumulation phase. That seems to be very much where the FCA are focused on. And it's also why you know you, you will have seen a lot of work uh, from a number of platforms and asset managers of late focusing very much on retirement solutions. So 
lots of work around prod and making sure that your investment solution fits the appropriate demographic and, and target market. And also, more and more people talk about that thing called the central retirement proposition, which should sit alongside your central investment proposition. And your CRP, as opposed to your CIP, your CRP is very much focused on what's the investment solution, what's the investment approach for people who are now entering into decumulation, as opposed to the much easier concept of simply saving up over time whilst in, in accumulation mode. So they're the areas that you know, I think we'll see a lot more focus from the regulators on going forward. And so with that in mind, kind of, you know, the purpose of this webinar, the purpose of the surveys and, and the on-the-road sessions that we do is we try to understand your business so that as a as a platform offering services to you, we want to help. You know, without the you know, thousands of advisors who use the Age of our platform, there is no Age of Our Center whatsoever. So we're always looking for ways to understand your business better and to come up with solutions that we hope will help um, you in your practice. So two things just to trail um, that, that are in the process of being launched from us. First one is over the next month or so you'll see the launch of a new service from us which is called Fundamentals. Um, the idea behind Fundamentals acknowledges that AJVL now has a asset management business where we ourselves create our own model portfolios, which requires that we do lots of due diligence on, on, you know, on the thousands of investment funds that are available to use in the UK. Now, what we do in, in, in here at AJVL is we filter those thousands of opportunities down so currently about 75, but we'll be expanding our list to closer to 100 funds that we think are, are good, good value funds and, and good sound, uh, strong processes being employed by those fund managers. We actually think there's way too many funds in the UK. And what we try to do for, for our, for ourselves is try to sort the wheat from the chaff and, and try to really understand who are the funds that we would use in our own investment portfolios. Now, of course, that's a, significant undertaking requires a team of people to conduct hundreds of meetings and, and document those meetings in the form of due diligence notes and, and follow up meeting notes, which until now we've stored all of that information basically in our own private vaults. We have access to that information. And what we thought is, uh, given the information we've seen around the number of people who are managing their own model portfolios, and of course, we'll be doing their own due diligence on all of those funds in there. We just thought we might be able to give a bit of a helping hand. So the idea behind fundamentals is we'll be making all of our investment research on all of those funds. We'll be making that available free of charge on the platform. So anyone who has access to the platform will have access to fundamentals. Uh, and there'll be some useful tools that help you filter and search down the investment universe, the funds that you may be interested in. And what we'll do is we'll share our, our due diligence uh, records on all of those funds. And importantly, going forward as well, we'll be sharing our ongoing due diligence on, on those funds, which may be a help. So if, you know, if there are funds that we've got on our list that you're also using within, within your uh, model portfolio offering, you might want to use our due diligence notes and our ongoing due diligence to help support your use of those, those funds within your own investment offering entirely free, um, we've just been making that available in the next month or so. And actually, we've now we've launched this thinking specifically about suitability of investment advice in decumulation mode. Uh, for the past year or so, we've been working hand in hand with, with, with a number of advisors up and down the country, trying to understand about how investment solutions change when you do go from accumulation into decumulation mode. And we found that there were a number of strategies being used for people in decumulation, which you wouldn't expect to see in accumulation mode. And so with that in mind, we've built our own retirement portfolio service, uh, which again will be given away free of charge. So um, this, one, of the, one of the major things we know, of course, is if you're managing model portfolios on a advisory basis, any changes to portfolios require a two-way uh, communication. Which can be, which, which can be a bit painful, uh, from an administration point, point of view. 
So the strategies that we found that advisors were using for people in decumulation, uh, a lot of people were using 4% rule or variations on, on that rule uh, to help people get their heads around, you know, the, the need to think about the risks of, of, of longevity. Uh, but of course, once you go into withdrawal uh, and drawdown mode, you are now face sequence of risk, which is a risk that you've not previously faced. What we found is a number of advisors in order to help manage sequence and risk, we're doing, we're doing two things. First of all, they were bucketing their portfolio or sectioning it off into, into different smaller pots. Um, we found that a number of advisors were used, were bucketing in, into three separate buckets. So a, a short term cash bucket was being used in order to cover immediate income needs from the client for maybe the next year or two. Uh, a medium term investment strategy was being used to generate income from from bonds and, and, and more uh, defensive assets. And we also found that you know longer term assets were being used to gain exposure to real investments such as equities and property, et cetera, where you get a, an inflation protection uh, built into those assets. We also found that um, advisors were using uh, um, natural income strategies as well. So instead of having to worry about the day-to-day fluctuations on the risky assets within the portfolio, if you can engender a situation where the income generated by those assets meets the client's income requirements, they don't really have to worry about the capital values on a day-to-day basis, and therefore they're less likely to do um, something that impairs, that impairs their portfolio by panicking. They can know that the income from that, those portfolios um, help help sustain their lifestyle. So we took all of those things, the 4% rule, the bucketing, and the natural income strategy, and created this retirement portfolio service. So what you'll find is the portfolio service splits money into three buckets, which is cash, uh, our income fund, and our income. And both of those funds employ a natural income strategy. So both of those funds are designed to produce a 4% yield. And so the income from those portfolios goes to top up the, the wine glass in our, in our metaphor here. So as the customer is drinking from the glass and taking income from the short term cash bucket, that cash bucket is being topped up by the income generated by the medium term defensive assets and the longer term real inflation protected assets. And then as a final feature on the retirement portfolio service, we know that the worst thing you can do when faced with sequence and risk is to panic and sell investments after they've had a fall in value. We've built a smart rebalancing feature in, into the service as well. So the service will automatically rebalance portfolios based on their own individual circumstances. So it acts as almost like a discretionary uh, fund management service, but it's delivered as a model portfolio service. It looks at each individual client's position, and it doesn't do an automatic calendar-based rebalancing. It does a rebalancing based on whether the client's seen any profits or losses on their, on their portfolios. If they've seen profits, we proof the profits, uh, because we know that over a 30-year investment horizon, which is the sort of investment horizon you ought to be thinking about, when, when you're looking at decumulation services, we know over a 30 year investment horizon, there will be certainly five or six bear markets, but we also know that there will be nine or 10 uh, bull markets as well. And so what we did, we tried to take advantage of knowing that we will see bull and bear markets and we take profits during the bull markets. So thereby reducing the probability that we need to take losses during the bear markets. So that retirement portfolio service combines all of those four features and the service itself is entirely free. If you have any questions on that, please reach out to your uh, to your, your contact at Asia Bell. Without further ado, that's us for the day. I'll wrap up and reach out to any of us at all if you've got any questions on any of this. And thank you for listening.